Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Joseph Grunfest, W.A. Frank Professor of Law and Business at Stanford University. We'll be discussing his recent paper, The Limits of Delaware Corporate Law, Internal Affairs, Federal Foreign Provisions, and a case name that I'll let Joe introduce. I'll include a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Joe, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. The case name is pronounced Shabakuki. All right, great. I know that's been a question out there in the ecosystem about this case, and I will do my best to remember that pronunciation. The paper is about uh, federal forum provisions, which are sometimes also referred to as the Grunfest solution. I wonder if you could open with some background of what these provisions are, uh, what their history is, and maybe what their purpose uh, has been. You know, whenever you come up with a solution, there has to be an antecedent problem. So let's start by describing the problem. Well, back in 1933, when Congress adopted the Securities Act, it created concurrent jurisdiction. Plaintiffs could bring Securities Act claims either in federal or state court. And for decades, the vast majority of these federal actions were quite rationally filed in federal court. Then, uh, beginning in about 2015, plaintiffs began migrating a large number of their actions to state court So that today, as a practical matter, approximately 75% of defendants in Securities Act Section 11 claims are facing claims that are filed in state court. Now, in state court, these claims are less frequently dismissed. And what that means is that causes of action that if they were filed in federal court that would have been dismissed wind up having settlement value because they're not dismissed in state court. So the perception is that we have an increased amount of Section 11 litigation, and much of this Section 11 litigation is of a lower quality than existed before the litigation migrated to state court. And as we see an increase in state court Section 11 claims, we also see a rapid increase in the price of DNO insurance, which is perfectly rational. If you're going to have more claims and if the claims are going to be for larger amounts, the price of insurance is going to go up. And federal forum provisions are designed to address this new evolution by simply saying that Securities Act claims that traditionally were litigated in federal court should stay in federal court. And it's a charter provision that basically says that. And so that's the Grunfest solution. It's a simple solution to a potentially large problem. All right, so let's talk about that solution a little bit. Let's talk about the Shavakuki case. What did the Chancery Court confront in that case? What did it hold? And how does that holding fit into or not fit into existing Delaware precedent and statutory law? Well, Chancery and Shavakuki held that federal forum provisions were invalid as provisions in Delaware charters and by implication also in bylaws. And the logic behind that decision, in my view, is extraordinarily fragile. Simply put, I don't think it works. The court relied on several different assumptions and and, and interpretations of the law. And, you know, let's just take some of them one by one. One of its major assertions is that purchasers under the 33 Act, plaintiffs in Section 11 claims, are not pre-existing stockholders. Now, what's fascinating when you read Shabakuki is you look at that assertion and you look for a footnote with citation support. You know what you find? Nothing. There is no citation support. You know why there's no citation support? Because there is no citation support. The proposition simply is wrong. If you look at SEC filings, you can find lots of examples of situations where registration statements disclose that existing stockholders are going to be purchasing. And there's a very common phenomenon in today's equity markets that's called order splitting. If an institutional investor wants to buy 100,000 shares of a company, they don't buy 100,000 shares in one trade. Nobody does that anymore. Instead, what they do is they split it. And for example, they might do 100 trades of 1,000 shares apiece. Well, if the institutional investor 
is not a pre-existing stockholder for the first thousand shares, they certainly are a pre-existing stockholder for the next 99 transactions and 99,000 shares. So the, the court's statement of fact on that is just simply wrong. So here we have the court really splitting the identity of the shareholder into two roles. One is the shareholder as shareholder, the other purchaser as purchaser. And your view is that that's a distinction that can't be credibly made under existing Delaware precedent. Well, two things. Not only does it not make sense under existing Delaware precedent, the, even if you accepted that proposition, the analysis and the opinion is fatally flawed because a, a defective registration statement that contains material misrepresentations is therefore a material misrepresentation to an existing stockholder who is buying more stock. We know from Malone versus Brincat that that's an internal violation of an existing fiduciary obligation of the board and of management not to lie to their stockholders. A defective registration statement is a traditional internal fiduciary breach. It's a lie by management to existing stockholders, and it can't be distinguished from the classic internal breach. So that's the Delaware side of things. Where does the Securities Act and federal precedent weigh in on this? Well, federal precedent here is fascinating because Shabakuki also makes the assertion that federal forum provisions are against the federal regime because they prevent plaintiffs from suing under state law and the statute provides for concurrent jurisdiction. It's a very interesting argument, but there's only one problem with it, and it's a big problem. There's existing Supreme Court precedent that says that that logic is just flat out wrong. All right. The case is Shearson versus Rodriguez. And in that case, the Supreme Court is looking at an arbitration agreement. And that arbitration agreement clearly says that you're going to arbitrate a Securities Act claim. And the defendants wanted to get out of the agreement. And the Supreme Court said no. Even though the statute provides for concurrent federal and state jurisdiction, and nowhere provides for arbitration, the Supreme Court said that the right to litigate in either isn't so fundamental that you can't arbitrate. And if you think about it, it's pretty clear that if the Supreme Court will allow for arbitration, which is not a forum that's defined in the statute, how could they not allow for the litigation of a federal claim in federal court when the statute provides for that form of venue. So a fortiori, you read Rodriguez, it has to be the case that you can force litigation under federal law of a Securities Act claim into federal court. In addition to the doctrinal concerns around Shabakuki that you highlight, you also note a few pragmatic issues that this holding might carry forward in the future. What are those and why might we be concerned about them? Well, if Shabakuki is upheld on appeal, I think the results are very adverse for Delaware and Delaware jurisprudence. First, if it really is true that Section 11 claims are external, as Shabakuki says, then think about the implications. Section 11 liability arises because the board has failed, among other things, in its obligation to draft and approve an appropriate registration state. Well, if that activity is external, then the state of California could adopt a regulation that requires that directors spend six hours uh, in videoed review of every registration statement um, in consultation with their lawyers uh, in order to demonstrate due diligence. Well, you know, traditionally, Delaware would say that's a violation of the internal affairs doctrine because we in Delaware get to control what happens with regard to anything in the boardroom. But then California would be able to cite Shabakuki and say, hey, wait a minute. Shabakuki makes clear that the Section 11 litigation, that all of this stuff is external. If it's external, it's not a violation of the Internal Affairs Doctrine. So Shabakuki, unfortunately, is setting Delaware up for conflict with sister states by narrowing the definition of what constitutes internal affairs. And that's it's totally against Delaware's historic approach, which has always wanted to expand the definition of internal affairs. But wait, there's more. 
There's a problem on the federal side, too, because if you look at what Shabakuki does, it in effect says that Delaware can prevent an action in federal court under federal law that's entirely consistent with the United States Supreme Court precedent. And from that perspective, what Delaware is doing is it's intruding into the federal space in a way that it has never before done. Nothing in Delaware jurisprudential history has ever said that we in Delaware will prevent either a corporation or a stockholder or any other party from exercising a right that's available to you in federal court. Shabukuki is the first case, to my knowledge, in Delaware history that crosses that line. You also touch on a few more practical day-to-day concerns, particularly, for example, as it might relate to DNO insurance. Could you speak on that? Oh, sure. I mean, if, if Shabakuki is upheld, Delaware Supreme Court, then the price of DNO insurance, which has already increased very significantly by some of the data that I've seen, you know, median retentions have increased by a factor of 10 from $1 million dollars to $10 million dollars for tech IPOs. And that's, that's a huge effect and premia. Um, the, the amount that you have to pay have increased by a factor of four, and that's on top of the fact that you're getting less coverage because your deductible is that much higher. So if Shabakuki winds up being held on appeal, um, uh, insurance rates are going to continue to go up, and they could go up even more substantially than they have now. Uh, there's a separate question. Will other states then say, gee, what we'll do is we'll allow federal forum provisions – and then you get a different form of, you know, competition. And if other states allow federal forum provisions, will the insurance market respond by saying, for example, you'll pay higher premia if you're chartered in Delaware, but if you're chartered in, for example, let's, let's assume Nevada, all right, uh, just to pick a random state decides to allow federal forum provisions, but you know, your premia will be significantly lower if you're chartered in Nevada. That will put IPO issuers in a very interesting position because there will then for the very first time be a precise dollar penalty that you have to pay for the privilege of chartering in Delaware. Shabakuki, I think, interacts in an interesting way with some of the debate around mandatory arbitration provisions and bylaws. And you could imagine that opponents of these provisions might see this case as a little bit of a victory. Is that the right way or is that an accurate way to look at it? Well, I, I, I think uh, people who are concerned about arbitration provisions need to look very, very carefully at the operation of federal forum provisions and at Delaware law, particularly a relatively new provision of the code called Section 115. So first, federal forum provisions. They are profoundly and inexorably anti-arbitration. Any corporation that picks up and adopts a federal forum provision, in effect, says, we're not going to arbitrate. We're going to go to federal court. So anyone who calls a federal forum provision or anyone who's worried about a federal forum provision as being uh, pro-arbitration simply has it backwards. How can you call a provision that says you shall not arbitrate, you're going to go to federal court? How can you call that an arbitration provision? It's nonsense. And I've heard people say it, and I sort of explain to them that that makes no sense, and they kind of go, oh, oh, yeah, okay, I guess. More fundamentally, though, the way Section 115 is written under Delaware law If you consider Securities Act claims, what's called in the section internal corporate claims because they're based on violations of Delaware law, which they are, and if you accept that interpretation, then mandatory Securities Act arbitration becomes impossible for every Delaware chartered corporation. So the approach to interpretation that I'm suggesting, in effect, gets rid of mandatory securities arbitration for every Delaware chartered corporation without any further action on the part of the Delaware legislature. You would think that opponents of arbitration might celebrate that, but, you know, some people are interesting. What can I say? People are interesting. What do you say to the fear that if we are free to have federal forum provisions, that might then open Pandora's box to arbitration provisions and the parade of horribles that might follow from it? Well, let's 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 go there. I love Pandora's boxes. You tell me 
All right. What is it that people are worried about? And I'll tell you why they shouldn't be worried about it. I think to characterize the fear, it's that if we have a system of adopting federal forum provisions, that would imply that other firms are free under Delaware law or the Federal Arbitration Act to mandate a different forum, in this case, arbitration. Sure. You know, but as I, as I explained the way I read Section 115, you cannot do that. All right. So it, it says that because these are all internal claims – and then with regard to the court's concern about, well, gee, you could use the charter to regulate tort claims or contract claims or conversion claims, with all due respect, that's just silly, all right? Because if you look at the plain language, you don't have to go to the court's first, you know, principles analysis. You just look at the plain language of the statute, all right? The statute talks about stockholders. It doesn't talk about tort claimants who happen to be stockholders. It talks about stockholders. And if that plain text is insufficiently plain, again, have a look at the language of 115. It talks about stockholders and directors in such capacity. Now, there's a doctrine of statutory interpretation, which is called the doctrine of consistent usage. And the doctrine of consistent usage would say, if the legislature says that it has to be stockholders in such capacity for purposes of 115, it's also going to be in such capacity for purposes of 102b1. And suing a stockholder because they're a tort claimant, all right, or invoking some kind of provision because a stockholder happens to be a tort claimant is then totally off the table because you're dealing with the stockholder in some capacity other than the capacity as a stockholder. So all of these parades of horribles and all of these, you know, sweaty, nightmarish visions, forgive me, simple textualism gets rid of all of them. Nobody has to worry about that at all. How should companies and practitioners be thinking about this holding? Is this something you expect that's going to be of limited duration and the Delaware Supreme Court is going to correct the error as you see it? Or do you see this distinction that you think isn't a real distinction between purchasers and stockholders continuing and maybe sh Shaba... Shabakuki. Shabakuki. And perhaps... <laughs> And, and and see the holding of Shabakuki carry forward and really have an impact on Delaware practice and securities litigation. I'll make you feel better. There's a very prominent lawyer in New York who cannot say Shabakuki for the life of him. So we agreed, all right, that we call this case Scooby-Doo. Oh, okay. Okay, he can say Scooby-Doo. We can't say Shabakuki. All right, so you can, I tell you what, I'll call the case Shabakuki. You <laughs> can call the case Scooby-Doo. All right, that works. All works. right, so... And, you know, obviously, I'm of the view that this opinion is going to be overturned. There's so much wrong with it, all right, that I can't imagine the Delaware Supreme Court saying, oh, okay, we're happy to affirm an opinion that's clearly wrong on its face in terms of factual assumptions, and that's clearly wrong uh, in terms of how it approaches controlling United States Supreme Court precedent. I'm happy to bet that the Delaware Supreme Court doesn't go there, all right? The other thing is, if the court rules, under whatever theory, that you can't have a federal forum provision, that's going to create a wide variety of doctrinal issues that will be more serious for Delaware jurisprudence than any problem, if any, that's generated by recognizing federal forum provisions. So, you know, if you look at it from a legal or a policy perspective, in my view, the, the clearly better way to go is to say federal forum provisions are entirely fine. All right. Uh, you just look it on the face of the statute, entirely consistent with the statutory text. No problem. Let's move on. Joe, what open questions do you think there still are, or what would you like listeners to take away from this paper in Shabakuki? Well, I think as a practical matter that words have meaning. The words of the statute need to be respected. The Delaware legislature uh, enacted the DGCL. The DGCL, I think if fairly read, clearly and unequivocally supports the validity of federal forum provisions. And it's dangerous when courts get involved in the kind of purposivist analysis that animates Chancery's opinion in Shabakuki, because the danger is that an individual chancellor is substituting his or her value judgments 
for the pronouncements of the legislature. And that's problematic. Our guest today has been Joseph Grunfest, W.A. Frank, Professor of Law and Business at Stanford University. We've discussed his recent paper, The Limits of Delaware Corporate Law, Internal Affairs, Federal Foreign Provisions, and Shabakuki. I'll include a link to the paper in the show notes for today's episode. Joe, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.